Namaste and in La Catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and this week's we're going to have a just a dynamic conversation with a wonderful guy that's traveled the world and got a really great background behind him as well. This is Mac Scotty McGregor, the gender sensei. <laughs> and Mac is a transgender activist and educator who provides gender and LGBTQIA diversity training for corporations, colleges, and groups all over the world. He's a co-founder and executive director of Positive Masculinity Now. We really need that. Yeah. And he's a radio talk show uh, host for You Can Make a difference or you can make a difference show on the rainer avenue radio world network he's also got a bachelor of arts in theological studies so this is going to be a fun conversation <laughs> welcome thank you zen great to be here <laughs> so i understand that you have had quite the interesting journey in getting where you're at now and you know as we all in our passion plays if you will there's an inner side to that. Oh, yeah. And when did you first notice this inner connection that you had and that fueled the passion that came about? You know, I, I think I was born an old soul. Um, I, I, I know very young, I looked at things differently than a lot of people. I was born in the South, in the Bible Belt of the United States, and, you know, in that environment, um, they usually try to box you into very small containers. <laughs> Can we, they, uh, they do it in the Midwest, too. I was raised yeah. in Indiana. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't want me. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. We're scary people, those of us. That oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For a time. That's right, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, all that messaging I was being fed in the, you know, very religious Southern Baptist type world I grew up in, I always had this bigger picture than they were feeding me. I would look at their messages and they would say, God is love. But there was a big but yeah. after that, you know, because I saw, but you're not supposed to hang out with these people or like yeah, these. walk and talk don't necessarily match. Right. And it just didn't make any sense to me, even as a, as a young person, you know, I saw through that. And, it, and so, well, do you find that pretty much present with most young people, right? They don't get caught up in the BS. With, well, now, with but not the so belief much systems. Then. Yeah, not so much back then, yeah. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, now, that's I was true. I was born in the 60s, so I think, uh, you know, it was a little different. We didn't have all the information available at the tip of our fingers that we do in nowadays. And, and, uh, you know, young people were much more indoctrinated by their churches and their families and their, you know, basically sure. Sure. Teachers because they just couldn't access the kind of information we do nowadays. Yeah, and we can't blame them, right, for right. for growing up with the views and the perspectives they did because that's all they had. Right, exactly, yeah. So I questioned everything, and, you know, when I went to my Southern Baptist High School, I got sent to the office a lot for questioning the bible teacher <laughs> no, i can't imagine that how dare i question what they were saying right <laughs> yeah so i've always had this curiosity and and you know um interest in in asking questions which is annoying to some people who really don't know their stuff and don't have the answers right well yeah you, you're given prescriptive narratives texts all those kinds of things from which to draw from but when you're asked to think for yourself there's a lockup right yes and as a teacher you know then then years later as i became a teacher myself i mean the biggest thing i wanted to teach my students was to ask questions was to be Socratic method right yes exactly i even ran a, a thing in Florida for years called the Socrates Cafe. I ran a group discussion, you know, ran a group around this, these things, you know, because that's what keeps us young too, right? It's oh, absolutely. Like, curious. Curiosity, yeah. radical, insatiable. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Have it. And it keeps us growing and learning. 
yeah. right? It keeps yeah. us from becoming, it keeps us from becoming people in a fixed mindset. Which nowadays, I think there are a lot of people, unfortunately, in a fixed mindset. And <clears throat> we got a good dose of how many just recently. Yeah. And those that weren't are also saying, hey, wait a minute, with a little louder voice. Right. And they're growing in numbers. Yeah, for sure. So I've always seen this bigger picture to things, you know. And so, so um, you know, it's not kind of surprising that here I end up you know, teaching people to look at the way they were socialized and the social conditioning they had growing up and go back as an adult and re-examine this and decide mm -hmm. what still serves me well from this and what doesn't, what's BS is, and is not helping me and be able to get rid of it. Sometimes yeah. I think the work is, is doing more unlearning than it is learning. <laughs> right? There's a phrase, I don't know who said it, that it's the, something like the most important thing to do is unlearn outer teachings. Yes. Right. And because they get in the way. Uh, yeah. They're good for a while. You know, they accomplish some things. However, they're not to the full benefit of our being. There's, there's only a partial bandwidth that it covers, right? That's right. Yeah. Now, when you were growing up, though, and, and you were talking about, you know, how you were kind of not fitting in, do you remember some of the questions that prompted you to dig deeper and, and those things that came up as a result? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was constantly questioning, why am I here? What is my purpose, right? Those were questions that I knew very young. I mean, I read you know, books like from Leo Biscaglia and, and The Course in Miracles at 16. And, and I was reading, um, <laughs> you know, I was reading about death and dying Elizabeth Kubler-Ross at that age too. Oh, cool, cool. So yeah, I was yeah. really, you know, which Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is, as you know, was, I mean, an amazing teacher herself. Absolutely. And, and being, and, and I mean, she talked a lot about, you know, what, what, is it that we that that comes to us in the end, right? Is it, we we never in the end, you know, are worried is about end? how much money we made. Well, the end of this phase, <laughs> of this phase. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, you know, it's a it's a change <laughs> for sure. We're changing. It, it's a change of form, although right. Um, and, and maybe we'll get into this in a bit. But I do want to share one thing. It, it, similar, growing up, <clears throat> I was orphaned and adopted. And at four, I found out that my, that I was adopted. My sister came home with no preparation, right? I was kind of told that she was on her way, but she shows up. And then my parents decided to explain what adoption was. Well, it sent me inside with several questions. Do I have, you know, who, who are my biologicals? Uh, why? Right. And an interesting one is, do I have a father and mother in heaven? And can I talk to them? Mm. And so the inner voice, the, uh, a couple of months later, I'm standing in front of a window one night, and I hear this big booming voice say, hey, you. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and I spun around and asked mom if she heard it. She was sitting 15 feet away. It was loud enough. I know she should have heard it. Not a clue. So then I realized it came from inside. Different perspective. Yeah, for sure. I also, as a young child, had a, had a, I had my first out-of-body experience, I think, as a very young child. Um, I would have been between four and five years old. And I remember this experience. No doubt. I have it's so hard to forget those. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and it was around um, my mother's second husband. There was a lot of violence. He was extremely violent and they were fighting and he was beating her. And I got woke up in the middle of the night and snuck out of my room into the hallway to see what was going on. And, and you know, I was seeing the violence and I, I remember my little, I, I remember seeing from behind my little self there, uh -huh. you know, and, and basically telling myself, you're okay. You know, and, and it was calming to me. Like I was able to like talk to my little self. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, phenomenal and, and rare and, and very special. 
Yeah. Right? It's kind of a gift. A lot of folks will say, well, uh, I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it is when you have that, especially so young. Uh, I Similar things happen as an eight-year-old. Uh, and I started having OBEs when I was seven. Sim and the first one started and I was a little freaked out, right? And, and it was more, I was laying on the bed and I started to rise out. And I thought, oh my God, am I dying? And then this voice that had approached me a couple of years before says, just relax, take a breath, let go. It's yeah. okay. And so I did. I pop out and I'm on the ceiling. And then all of a sudden I'm back in my body again because I'm thinking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing I remember about that experience is thinking, and I've thought more a lot about this as I got older, of course, is thinking, what can I do to help? Like, mm. what can I do? And of course, as a, I wasn't big enough to be able to do anything to protect her. Right. At that point. <clears throat> but I bet you got a lot of water in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Astrologically, what are you? The, I'm the, a Pisces. The, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> Cancer, my wife's Pisces. So yeah. Can relate. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, it's so interesting. And then, of course, uh, throughout my life, I've had a few other out-of-body experiences. One in, in competition in my my extensive martial arts background. Um, and I was also on the U.S. karate team for many years. And I had a, a few, I had a couple of experiences in competition where I saw myself from outside of my body in the competition. Now, yeah. Now that is much rarer to be able to have that kind of, you know, when you're engrossed in an activity yeah. and then have it, that's quite unique. And, and what happened? So was this, were you in the process of trying to figure out what your next move was and, <laughs> and out or what? Yeah, it was a, it was a really long extensive competition where I fought 17 different uh, fights, battles in wow. one day. And so there was that's a exhaustive. point, no kidding. And this is my, I mean, just to give a little background for folks, this is my 51st year as a martial artist. I started at six years old. So it was literally like walking to me by the time I was a young adult. You know, I'd been doing it so long. I didn't have to think a lot about what right. to do. You My just body. had mechanics and body memory and instinct right. at that point. Yeah. And, and so I think that's part of what allowed that is because my body just, my muscle memory was there to know a lot to do so I could relax. And be, you know, right. Have, right. Well, one of the things, and especially with Aikido, is that, that ultimate centeredness where you're not there. Right. Yeah. I have a six degree black belt in Aikido. Yeah. I have, um, okay. I have several arts I've studied and Aikido is actually one of my favorites. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. It's an amazing art. It's about redirecting energy. <laughs> so I love that. Yeah. yeah. I like the cosmic Aikido mm -hmm. myself. Me too. Me? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the better you get at Aikido, you don't have to do the physical part, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, they're, they're, you know, and you know, with Aikido, Qigong is another one yeah. where, you know, the chi, it can be so present and useful that you don't have to touch anything. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, one of the other experiences talking about that, that I've had, um, you know, I was featured on Ripley's Believe It or Not, the Learning Channel, the Discovery Channel, doing something called combat ki. Ki is the Japanese word. Chi is the Chinese word. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, life force, internal energy. And um, so I am a, a ki, a combat ki master, which means... Oh, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. I was featured having 300-pound men punch me in the throat. Uh, and four around the neck at one time, which uh, I did this in front of doctors and professors at Mayo Clinic, and they all freaked out and told me that I just blew everything they thought they had learned in medical school and everything, they, because they said, you should be having all this trauma right now, and you're standing here talking to me after this guy, much bigger than you, just punched you as hard as he could in the throat. You should be, you know, having a crushed windpipe and having all this, you know, trauma. Right, right. Well, essentially, you stepped into the quantum world. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
And what's so funny is even on Ripley's Believe It or Not, the guys that hit me and the few of us that have this training, there's like 30 of us in the world that have this master level in this, um, they complain that it hurts them to hit us, <laughs> which yeah, I yeah, love. Yeah. And the reason is because we are literally focusing mind, body, breath on pushing the energy back out to them. So we don't, we don't accept the energy from the strike coming into us. We push it back. And, and so it makes a U-turn basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the ways I describe this to folks is if you've, most people have seen somebody try to break a board or a block on TV or whatever, some people live, and if they break it, they're fine. But when it hits the object and it does not break, they come back and hold their hand because that energy hits the object and it has to go somewhere. And if it doesn't go through, it comes back up to them. Right. Yeah. It's just, a oh, that, again, um, what is it? Uh, call and response. Yes, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, and so I've had, I mean, they even brought in an NFL football punter uh, to kick me in the crotch and kick me in the ribs <laughs> and, you know. You know, we had the same, same kind of, ex, uh, uh, and you may know the guy. I can't remember his name. This was in 1975. It was in a Gen Ed 230 course at Ball State University. And there was a guy that we did, you know, demonstrations of what we thought the future would be like. Mm -hmm. And this guy chose to step up and, and demonstrate this very kind of technique that you're talking about. And it was mind blowing. Yeah, it might have been Rod Sakarnowski because um, <laughs> he's a, a former military uh, Marine and and. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, so seventy-five, he would have been. I'm guessing twenty-ish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's like in his eighties now. So eighty. Yeah. yeah so that. Well, not that far yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a little closer, maybe. But yeah. But anyway, uh, it's pretty amazing um, and empowering, right? To let somebody hit you with everything they have, and you stand there and smile, and you know, talk to them afterwards. Right, right, and, and the and what I also hear and see in that is that there's this. And it's going to sound weird, but I think you'll understand it. There's a total lack of protection. It's all energy. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? There's no mindset of oh I got to protect myself. No, no. There's no. just a stance in yourself. Yeah. Yes, you have to stay focused, of course. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and one of the things I, I tell people the biggest battle to that is um in your own mind right if you allow fear to come in you're going to get hurt right what you focus on you're going to produce that's exactly right yeah so you know it is an inner battle that you go through to get to that level to take shots like that um but wow the the i think we're only beginning to scratch the potential of mind body breath focused together and what we can do with that mm -hmm. i mean with the stuff i've done i go well i do stuff that i shouldn't be able to you know doctors tell me i shouldn't be able to do and so it tells me there's all there's of course much more possible right? there, there is at, at 19 uh, the year after that experience with the gen ed class um, a bunch of guys and I had, and gals were experimenting with telepathy. And I had a friend that had gone up to his grandfather's cabin and uh, was supposed to be back for winter quarter that year. Hadn't returned yet. Um, I remember laying down one night, plugging in a, a tape to some music and, and going through the process, picturing his face, looking into his eyes, grabbing by his shoulders, which was different. And I stood him up in my vision. Right. And I, I was talking with him and his girlfriend from the year before we all three hung out together. She came into the conversation. This is all visual, right? Internal. And then the following, that was on a Saturday morning, following Friday, I call him up to see when he's going to be home because I'd talked to his parents, had no clue when he was going to get there. And he answers the phone out of breath. And I said, dude, I said, <laughs> where you been? He said, I just got home, knew that was you on the phone. Okay. So cool couple hours enough time went over picked him up first thing that i said to him when he got in the car so i looked him square in the eyes i said you catch any flack last weekend 
And I thought that was a pretty, you know, neutral conversation or a question. He could go anywhere with it. And he looks at me and says, yeah, you son of a bitch. You woke me up out of bed. I'm like, what? He <laughs> said, yeah, I was laying there sound asleep. I felt somebody grab my shoulder, set me up in bed. I opened my eyes up. There was your face. Yeah. And behind you was Carolyn, the girl. Mm -hmm. And then a week and a half later, he gets a postcard from a Krishna camp in California with the address circled. Now we're in Indiana. And all it says on it was enjoyed the conversation and it was in Carolyn's handwriting. Mm. So those kinds of things, even at 19, it's like, oh man, it just blew my mind of the what we power we can wield. However, there's a sacredness, yes, reverence that has to be maintained toward it, or you destroy yourself with it. Oh, yeah. You know, speaking about that, you're right. I've had a lot of um People, of course, after they've seen me do the things I've done with Combat Key, ask me to teach them that. And there's certain people I will not teach those skills to because I think there's a responsibility, like you said, in reverence toward it. And some people would use it in a in a negative way. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think that it's a it's a precious tool. You know, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the things with our uh, live and not live movement. Yeah. We have two principles, live and let live. Well, live is moral, be a good human, okay? And we have great, you know, gatherings around that topic. And then the second is don't be an aggressor. Right. We call that our legal principle. And so eventually we're going to filter out all the laws and legislation that allow aggression of any kind. Right. Long term. <laughs> that's going to take yeah, some work. You know, a lot of people hear that and they go, oh, that's going to be impossible. Well, <laughs> if you change that around a little bit, it's I'm possible. Oh, totally. Yeah, right? I, I'm totally with you on that. That's right. And you know what? Um, we shouldn't be threatened by things if we're secure in who we are. Yeah. Right? It's one of the things I teach guys in, in positive masculinity now is one of the things I teach them is why are you threatened by women or LGBTQ people or anybody different than you? If you're secure in who you are, that nobody else is a threat to you. Right. <laughs> you know? It's your choice to be that way and yeah. you can change that. Yeah. Exactly. All you got to do is make a choice. Yes. Right now, along with that, what do you find as, as far as, you know, this baggage? Oh. It's being carried that infects that kind of choice. And because this flight, there's no carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I'm constantly trying to shed the baggage. And, and, no, I, because we still have a little bit of it, it creeps up. Oh, totally. It does creep up. I mean, that's just part of this walk you know yeah. right yeah, exactly. and uh, you know i constantly in fact i have a stick it note put the baggage down put it down you don't have to carry <laughs> it, you know? and i think that that i'll tell you i had a a life-changing monumental experience in my early 30s um a mentor of mine took me to lunch and um I had been dealing with my mother is mentally ill and I'm the oldest kid. So I had done a lot of caretaking, a lot of picking up the pieces my whole life mm -hmm. from the train wrecks that she would leave, you know, sure. and her emotional meltdowns and things like that. She's on her 12th marriage now. And, uh, you know, she was married five times by the time she was 25 and had me at 16. So there's a lot, you know, mm -hmm. it was a yeah. lot to carry. Right. And I was always and, and what an opportunity. I mean, the, most of us would see that as oh shit, man, right? However, and you probably did the, the, for a little while, and then when you got older, it's like, and maybe this this is what you're leading up to with the conversation with your mentor. Yeah. So I'll I'll truncate my. <laughs> well, we'll get back to that, I'm sure. But one of the things raised in the South, right? If it w was, you know, that that whole taking care of your family, take the obligation to take care of your family, right? Absolutely, and, and uh, you know, and I, I was the oldest, like I said, so I felt a lot of that. And my mentor set me down and said, "Mac, it's not your responsibility to fix your mother." And I just sat there for a minute. I was like, what? "Because I was constantly trying to fix her, right? 
I was constantly trying to, you know, make it better in some yeah. way. Typical Piscean too, right? Right. You know, and teacher, <laughs> I want to help people, right? You want, I mean, it comes from a good heart, but you can't. Oh, absolutely. A near pure heart in, in that. It's just the, the, the Piscean desire to control. Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can't fix anybody that doesn't want to change it doesn't want to you know, it's like well that's one of the things the other thing he said but to is me. it how many did who was it psychiatrists or psychotherapists does it take to change <laughs> a light bulb yeah <laughs> no, i don't know the light bulb has to want to be changed that's right. the light bulb has to <laughs> want it yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean but it, for that to really sink in from somebody that i looked up to as a mentor to say you can, and he basically, he did say that actually to me, you can put that baggage down. You don't have to carry that yourself anymore. That is not your responsibility. <sighs> I felt lighter when I left that lunch, I will tell you, and, and like more free. Well, yeah, I, because the constriction, if, for lack of a better, of the want of fixing, yeah, right? That gets you really focused and, and directed toward some kind of control. Yeah. And then you just got released from it. It's like, whew. And I, I felt that same in my life. Not that, you know, I don't want to control stuff too. Right? <laughs> um, I, I'm just as guilty as the next guy. I'm a little better that, with age. Me too. And, and yet it's <laughs> still there. Yeah, yeah. I am as well. Yeah. And it's kind of hard, right? If you have somebody in your inner circle of life that is constantly leaving train wrecks and you've had to pick up a lot of the pieces, it's kind of hard not to want to do things to try to help make it better. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know well, but also part of the lesson is learning that not just that you can't is that even when you do, it doesn't make any difference. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's the other part of what he told me. It's not your responsibility to keep cleaning the messes up. You don't have to keep doing that. You know, it's not your mess, right? You don't have right. to keep cleaning it up. You right. know? Um, yeah. Well, but of course, it, you know, you're the good scout. You want to leave it better than you found it. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I've always been the good scout. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but... So uh, how... Now, this really you know, kind of gave you a point of view that few others have, which also gave you the foundation from which to take the next leap in, into something that really matters on a grander scale and that the, in the work that you're doing now. How did that take place? Or, or was that kind of sort of the same time when you began to look elsewhere to apply your healing skills? <laughs> yes. Well, I had already had a dojo for a while at that point, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I was already, you know, leading a, a a family, you know, basically a dojo the way the way I ran it, the way I was raised, and it was is a is an extended family, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and and that's what well, you're caring for. Oh yeah, and I, I mean, kids, I watched them grow up and bring their kids then into the dojo. So you're like a part of each other's family, literally. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and you a very deep part because of the discipline and the value system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was able, though, to be freer to focus more of my energy into that, mm -hmm. um, into my students and into my teaching and, and, and also into my own health and growth and well-being, you know, because right. when you're dealing with somebody that is constantly leaving train wrecks, right? And feeling like you're responsible to clean it up. That takes a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. It does. And, and in that kind of dis-ease, it can really affect your body too. And fortunately it didn't because probably, you know, the discipline and, and right. your activities as, as a martial artist. Right. Yeah. The long term of that stress, though, you know, being on the hypervigilance and stuff is not good for any of us. Right. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, it makes it a little wrap, wrapped a little tight. 
That's right. Yeah. Good thing that I had the outlet of working out like that. Sure. <laughs> sure. And, and it's good that you do. You know, I, I've got, I've been a drummer since I was you know, uh -huh. a teenager and, and man, there's nothing better than just kicking out some good tunes or playing along with them to release energy and, and take it to a different place. Yeah, I tell people all the time that have been through um, something tough in their life, you know, or they're grieving because they've lost someone close to them or whatever. I talk to them about moving that energy through their body. Don't let it, don't hold it in there. You need to mm -hmm. move it through. And, it, you know, people can do that in different ways. Some of them go to, you know, ecstatic dance. Some of them work out at the gym, you know, whatever works for you. Some of them go hiking, whatever. Yeah, just do something. Yeah physical that's right because we are in this you know shell for this for this no, we're, we're condensed into it you know as an intelligence or cosmic consciousness if you will that's condensed into this form unbeknownst to us right right and yet we have this these moments of acquiescing to a greater ability power um capacity that we have like you applying your discipline in, in the martial arts and being in that centered place and nobody able, being able to touch you right yeah right that's right. an example of the focused in um, consciousness and energy yes but integrating all of yeah. that the fact that each cell in our body also has its own intelligence and, and, you know, that's something I remind people all the time is be careful of your inner talk, of your inner dialogue, because you're sending messages all the time to every cell in your yeah. body. Yeah. And uh, who is it? Um, listen. Mas Masaru Emoto? Mm -hmm. Yes, the water. Right. Yeah, yeah, the water guy, guy. the water yeah. crystal guy. Perfect yeah. example of it. You know, you sit there and you think thoughts and, and you freeze the water and it has all these different patterns in yeah. it. Well, we're over 60% water. What do you think that does to your body if you're thinking those thoughts? That's exactly right. And it's not that it's not that even those of us that have are conscious of that are not going to now and then have a negative thought come through, but hmm. but the difference is that hopefully we have enough awareness to stop it in its tracks and replace it with something healthy. Right. You know, and that's what I, I teach and that's what I a practice I do myself. It's not that sometimes, you know, you're not going to have a thought that says, oh, you're not, I'm not worthy of this or, oh, you know, I screwed up once before I'll screw this up again. We all have sometimes those negative things that come through. It's that we don't sit in them. And we're artists at self-deprecation. Yes. Yeah. We can be our own biggest critics. Yes, for sure. Right. And when one person says something negative, we'll focus on that versus the 10 people who said something wonderful. Right. Positive, right? Now, do you find that in that process of moving from one thought to another, there's a pause button first, right? Yes. So there's a, a complete stillness, silence moment of where you then can choose the next thought. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And there's an acknowledgement that this is something I don't want. This is negative and I don't want it. It kind of reminds me, and I'll make a joke right now about growing up to church in church. Not today, Satan. You know? right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. You know, I heard and actually re did some research on names on the word Satan in, in this dictionary at, at Ball State, as I told you before, um, they had those two A through M, L through Z, you know, huge volumes. And so I go in the library one day and I'm just compelled to look it up. Well, the first reference is the Greek, Satan, T-H-E-T-A-N, which means thinker. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, you slide devil, you. That's right. right? Yes. It just got snuck into a little bit of a misuse of the word. However, it got snuck into the literature and it made sense, even though it was all BS. Oh, yeah. Which is why I got sent to the office in high school. Because oh, I was God. a thinker. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're thinking not, but not in the way we want you to. You're <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah.
it is hilarious isn't life so wonderful the the trials and tribulations that we have and, and in the moment it's not so fun however you look back and you just laugh your ass off at oh, it totally you have to be able to have a sense of humor about it all right yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely. yeah and, you know i actually even though you know there's a lot of uh discrimination i think that a lot of organized religion teaches about certain groups of people um i also got gained a lot of there were some good lessons that i learned you know um from from that experience of growing up and that i mean one of the lessons i learned helped me a lot as a teacher you know which is sometimes you're going to be the one that plants the seed in somebody sometimes you're going to be the one that waters it sometimes you'll fertilize it but you're not always going to be the one that gets to watch it right flourish you know watch it grow up all the way yeah. and so in other words sometimes people come into your world for a short time for a certain season for something and don't get hurt if they you know if they aren't a part yeah, of your yeah. life forever you be your best for them and don't worry about it that's right you know, would you agree that really the and i think this is ubiquitous in all religions spiritual teachings everything the the very core of it is simply to love and be loved yes yes and we have so much more for goodness sake oh we don't know how to do that and then we do different you know people focus so much on the differences and i we have so much more in common as just beings human right? being right exactly you know, i was teaching a class uh a week ago uh to you'll find this interesting to uh seattle police department um because they have me come in and teach all of their new recruits about gender and uh so there's me and then a, a, a f another friend teaches uh about gay and and um and lesbian history and stuff like that for them to understand and you know what i said to them and i said you know what the this guy and i the, the gay guy and i do when we go home the same thing you and your family does we make dinner we take out the trash we walk the dog guess what we're all we're all basically doing the same stuff we're not that different right 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 and who are we to determine how we love one another you know as long as you do in the way that you do to the best of your ability right you can't fault anybody else you know that's part of uh, that's a little bit of being a good human no and not being an aggressor that's right yeah right? i have no reason right to tell you how to live your life right or who to love yeah <laughs> exactly no right. one does or and what they authenticity is for you yeah right that's the thing i mean so what I got you into this i mean uh, the, i understand you know from your activity you were doing some really male stuff yes right <laughs> yes and yet you had this really large heart opening that says wait a minute this is not what this is all about there's much more and, and by seeing that then you stepped into it to support that effort how, how did that take place <laughs> ah <laughs> oh, i'm i have a string you know i have Can a string. yeah <laughs> or a calling or whatever you want to call it i okay I, you know i just knew very young that i was here to carry certain messages and and that is one of the messages you know seeing i also went to missions trips to haiti when i was a pretty young person i've been to eight medical missions trips mm. people of all different types you know in pain and celebrated with them and it's like you know you go to a third world country like haiti and you look at things a lot differently when you you know i've been there like i said eight times and gotten to know people there and 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 it's like yeah you change your thinking because people in our country well we're distant <laughs> we're not only resistant no, I said distant. Oh, distant. Yeah, we're distant. Oh, my gosh. You know, when you, <laughs> yeah, it, just the closeness. You know, you go to church in, a, in, a, in our country and people all have their own little space in Haiti. They're all shoulder to shoulder and packed together and nobody is worried about the fact that, you know, they're all, I mean, 
we're all about our space and all yeah. our, you know like, I spent some time in chile i spent a month in chile uh right th- right after the turn of the century and uh, i came back to uh, la i was living in uh, pacific palisades at the time the canyon and we'd put on a, a event there called gaia fest you had a couple thousand people show up and afterwards i i took notice that when i came back my heart was just huge uh, to the point where um i could tell the difference of the activity with americans was all above the shoulders mm, yeah and even though they wanted to do the right things there was still this i got to manage i got to control you know i can't let people just be free and, and you know have a good time whereas in chile everybody was like family they treated each other like family they and, and good families not the dysfunctional right. ones like you have but, right. but um yeah they share resources they they you know they're much quicker to do that than we are right one of the one of the pivotal moments in one of my experiences in haiti was talking to one of our interpreters and he said to me in america time is money and in haiti time is relationships yeah and he said i'll give you an example he said in america if you're on your way to make money so to go to work or whatever you do, right? And you see your neighbor broken down on the side of the street. A lot of people won't stop because if they do, they'll be late to make money. Mm-hmm. They'll just go on. In Haiti, he said, we would never do that. He said, we we only survive because we focus Help on each relationships other. and take care of each other, Right. That hit me, I'll tell you what, I've never forgotten that moment. I was in my early 20s and I've never forgotten that conversation because I, my response to him was, I don't want to be that type of person or that right. type of American. Right. That's not how I want to live. You know, there's something else I heard just this last year that what I thought was amazing. And it came from people from elsewhere. And they see time as a measurement in the change of entropy, mm, yeah. which fits perfectly into what you just said, yeah. right? The, there's this cacophony, oh, got to make money, um, not flowing. Right, I got to hurry up and get there to do it. Yeah. It's certainly not harmonious because it's a push-pull battle, right? Right, Competitive, all that, that kind of stuff. Whereas when you're in flow, there's harmony, time expands yes and you get a lot more done yeah. right and, and it feels good in doing it rather than the stress the, and the dis-ease that we feel in first world countries so true you know something since i was young that i've detested is that thing called the clock hmm. and, uh, <laughs> I, I never resonated with it um, even though, of course, I've had to. I mean, I sure do certain things I've done. Had to show up on class at class on time. Right, exactly. Yeah. Had to show up at the competition on time. All the things, you know. Right, yeah. yeah. But, um, but you know, it's also very limiting, and it controls us too much to the fact to the point that if we make a connection with someone when we're out in public, a lot of times we won't stay with that because we got to rush off to the next thing and we miss a lot of real human connections with people because of that oh yeah i i've i for one am not like that yeah. i connect with somebody i there, there's been people i've met complete strangers i'll end up talking to them for two or three hours yeah we just like you know we fall into this because your eyes connect you feel the energy you recognize that you've got kindred spirits you, then there's much to share so you go do it yeah i yeah my wife is as now she understands that because she's like if you're God, just send me a message and let me know if you're supposed to be home that you where you are that you're safe and then i'll just let it go because right, you know, yeah. like, yeah. like well the person at the grocery store was telling me their life story and i couldn't leave you know? <laughs> and we're like that because yeah. we're available and, and we're vulnerable enough 
to be present and, and not be concerned about needing to be someplace at a particular time. Although sometimes we do need to be and we have to truncate things. Right. And we actually look people in the eye and see people. Yeah. That's the other thing is taking the time to just be present, even with the cashier as you're checking out. You can mm -hmm. make a huge difference. You know, one of the things with my my radio show that you can make a different show is I tell people you don't have to do big things all the time to make a difference. It can it, be just making a connection with someone. When you do the little things, the big things take care of themselves. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. They they, do. You know, they, they did a study that uh, not long ago that... Um, People that have been married for a long time, they put them in separate rooms and ask them what the, their spouse's eye color was. And some of them couldn't remember because they hadn't looked each other in the eye in so long. Oh, my God. I don't know about you, but my wife and I have been out when we've seen couples sit at a table at a restaurant and not say with two words to each other. They're on their phone or they're distracted or they just don't, you know. I'm sorry. I, I'm laughing. I'm not sorry. I, I'm Zen. Um, so when when my wife and I first met, I had, she's from St. Petersburg, Russia. We met at a Kundalini yoga teacher training graduation. Didn't know she was even part of it until I heard her name mentioned. And it was like, oh, Russian. Ooh, cool. You know, because I have this life themed with harmony among people and planet. What better partner to have than somebody who's supposed to be an enemy? Right. right. Exactly. So, and I've got this stuff going through my head. So I once I uh, things finish up and, and she's available the it, it was like the whole room cleared out and i'm talking with her and i'm looking at gazing into her eyes i don't blink a whole lot i didn't i'm aware of that yet i'm not thinking about it while i'm talking to her right and i i asked her if you know she'd like to have coffee or i told her she was intriguing i'd like to have coffee or maybe even i could make her lunch and and the first thing she says to me are you reading me <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I would have never expected that kind of response. Of course, it made me think, oh, yeah, I'm gazing. I, I, that makes people uncomfortable usually because I do look people directly in the eye. Mm -hmm. and I linger. Yeah. And I don't blink. Well, the theory is the eyes are gateway to the soul. So why would you want to inhibit that? Right. Right. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, except when you get dry eyes right you well, gotta think every once in a while there's that um, yeah and, and yet you know that, that kind of beginning was just perfect and i that was in 2016 we got married in 2017 on the fall equinox which was um just an amazing time and, and life with her has been just constant it's like we've been together forever and we're still learning little nuances oh gosh yeah yeah, yeah well you know, nobody's the same as they were yesterday, too. So you're going to continue learning about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. You got a cellular change going on, too. Right. You do. Yes. <laughs> so true. All right. So speaking of cellular change. Yes. That, that, that's a great segue, huh? Yeah. So how did you get back in? And I asked this question before we went off on a tangent, which we, we do. Uh, how what was the impetus in in being able to say hey look guys th there's other ways to love and not be offended by it uh well <laughs> isn't I, that kind of that, that i that i kind of hit that nail on the head not that i'm always carrying a hammer <laughs> well you mean with my work with positive masculinity yes um what I saw was that the modeling and messaging that many people have received around the way they were socialized around their gender puts a lot of limits on us. And a lot of people don't even realize that it's limiting them or harming them until you have a conversation about it with them. You know, they're unaware of it, right? Hmm. As we usually are, we're unaware of what's going in inside until we can talk about it to somebody else or we get asked a question. Yes. It makes us, go. oh, I've never been asked that question before. Back to Socrates now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the highest rate of suicide is among middle-aged men. And I was 
looking at all of this and I thought, well, why is that? And then I went back to this social conditioning and socialization. Well, what are men told growing up to shut down their uh, part, most of their emotional being for one thing, mm -hmm. right? Primarily. You're only allowed two emotions, you know, mad and, and, and happy, right? That's it. <laughs> mad or high five in your buddies. Right. You know, and you have to be competitive. And you always have to be competitive. I talk a lot about this messaging, which is another reason. It's another, to me, obstacle in men having healthy, intimate friendships. Because if I'm always in competition with the other guys around me, when, do, when is it okay for me to let my armor down to be vulnerable with them? Well, not if you're in battle all the time, right? You're not going to let no. your armor down because the competition is a battle, right? right. And, and it also keeps us from collaborating more. Good Lord, take away the competitiveness and realize how much more we can accomplish and do and learn when we collaborate. Well, there's <laughs> a guy named uh, Dudley Lynch. Um, he's the president of Brain Technologies. They came up with a lot of OD surveys. Uh, one of them is called Yo Dolphin. And he wrote a book, uh, a couple of books, The Way of the Dolphin, uh, as, mar as a management book in the 80s. Uh, and that was yeah. quite the hit. And then uh, Mother of All Minds. Mm. And in Mother of All Minds, he says we have uh, an alpha chassis, or alpha mind and alpha chassis, and how we see and act in the world and in, in the alpha mode which is steeped in competition right and then this new model still has the alpha chassis but it's got the beta mind and the beta mind understands oneness which is focused in collaboration yes and i found that quite intriguing and, and i think that, that book came out uh, around 2000 maybe a little bit later um it, wonderful man um uh, yeah. death born deaf and and yet still came up with all these things that, and sort of just did some amazing work still does actually yeah. it's one of the few that's still of that elk that's still alive <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah so i realized all of this you know and i thought why don't you know we start having these conversations and so i created a safe space for masculine folks to get together and have these conversations in an environment where our goal is to foster one another's growth. Mm -hmm. What a different environment, right? I mean, for instance, like we have monthly free online discussions where we have a different topic that we, um, you know, focus on for each month. And I mean, we had one month it, back in the summer where our, our topic was intimacy. Now, you're not going to get a lot of guy of men's groups that talk about intimacy in the way we did because our our goal was of the conversation was what are the obstacles to us having healthy intimacy hmm. now that's a big question right and that takes a lot of introspective work it's not you know anything about pointing the finger at our partner or you know because well, you got to remember you got three point back at you when you do that you got that right my nana taught me that very young <laughs> yes great lesson to remember you know and so, you know, those are the types of discussions we're having, but everybody in the group, what we ask is that their comments to anyone else's sharing comes from the place of wanting to help one another, support one another and foster one another's growth. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there aren't a lot of groups where men can talk to other men where they feel that kind of supportive atmosphere. Very true. Yeah. There's more that, that have been, you know, yeah, been, yeah. just uh, and, and that's only happened in what the last decade and a half, maybe. Right. And the majority of the groups, honestly, are church based groups. They're religious. There's yeah. a lot of men's groups that are church based groups about being the man of God. And of course, the way they're looking at it is I'm, I'm talking organized religion, you know, mm -hmm. whole, you know, groups, which is very different than we're not coming from that space at all. We're, we're talking about you know, just being the best human beings we can be, right? right. Yeah. yeah, so... we got to figure out what that really means because yeah. a lot of the behaviors that we exhibit, um, it's like complementary behaviors and non-complementary behaviors. It's true. 
yeah. right? That, that's because you, you get aggressed, you're going to aggress, right? Yeah. That's the the complementary behavior that we have because that we reciprocate mm -hmm. because we don't realize we have choice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Then the non-complimentary is when we recognize we have choice and we meet aggression uh, with a keto. I was just going to say that with a keto. That's right. right. Yeah. I knew that. Yes. Yeah, it's that water <laughs> stuff coming in. Um, it's just pouring through to me, right? So it, it, how did this affect the guys? What were the kinds of things that came up that were the most critical that you saw uh, facilitating the greatest change? Well, you know, I have a whole chapter in my book uh, of, called The Man Masks, and I think that those, mm. one of the biggest things that I saw happen was guys realizing that they've been wearing these masks and how exhausting that is to, you know, like one of the masks is i am got to be self-sufficient all the time, which means I can never ask for help. Right. Right, that's a Let alone mask. receive it. Right, yeah, totally. Yes, yeah, and that's exhausting. Nobody, you know, can carry that all the time. I got to be the strong person all the time. I can never, you know, lay that down. Right, yeah. All these things. I, I, I remember we did an exercise. I run a workshop on these man masks, and and I literally do an art project where they have to draw, people draw these things out. Like what masks have I been wearing? And, and we, we do this art thing where you paint, paint this out or, you know, or draw it out. And, and I've had a few guys look at this and go, Oh my God, I've been carrying a lot. They didn't realize how much they have been. And, you know, sometimes we well, sure you don't. So you start peeling back the, the layers and, and it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And, you know, and you go deep and, and then and then you have a few experiences where you go, oh, got rid of that. And yeah. something comes up and no, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah I was just going to mention, according to when we switch environments, right? Yeah. We wear a certain mask maybe at work. And then when we go back to visit our family, you know, our our, our old, old part of the family, like parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, you know, this, oh boy, does that change the masks yeah. put on, right? Yeah. And Harv, of course, Harv Ecker says, what, what, what you do anywhere, you do everywhere. Yes. Oh, yeah. And that's a tough one for us to see sometimes, too. Yeah, it is. Because we think, you know, okay, I got to be this person over there and this person over there, and I can't let those two mix, you know, leave work at home, work at work and home at home. Yeah, it doesn't happen. That's just not natural. Right. It isn't. And it's exhausting. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy <laughs> away from you. You know, that, that's why it's hard to be centered and at peace when you're juggling all that. Yeah. Right? And yet to be at centered, be centered in peace at, and in peace is probably the easiest thing you'll ever find to do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But you have to learn it because our society pushes us to assimilate, to assimilate to what they Right. from us right, right. <laughs> well I, you know i'm an assimilationist and, and i've learned what to jettison in that process <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and the older i get the less give a shits i have about what they want me to assimilate to. right, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm okay with me i love me i i'm I, I what's there not to love about me right of course <laughs> yeah. and of course you know and do you find when in that place of confidence, of, of true masculinity, uh, of centeredness, that to others' eyes, that can sometimes come off as being very egoic? Hmm. Well, yeah, I think some... Because there, there, there's that confidence, right? There's that stalwartness that you don't put up with crap. Right. And you speak your mind and you don't care what anybody else thinks. And so a lot of times because of the lack of empowered listeners, mm -hmm. and I think it's all in the listening, yeah. you're listening from a different place. Oh, you're listening, listening from a disempowered, uncentered, diseased place. So how do how does that switch in, in your groups? Does it because I'm sure that's part of what happens in, in that demasking <laughs> for sure you know 
Well, one of the things that I work on myself and, and translate to the, the guys in the group, um, you know, for everybody to be thinking about this, is how do I say what's on my mind and yet still do it through a lens of kindness and compassion? Right. Right. You know, I don't have to be an asshole to say what's on my mind, right? I mean, I can, and, and so it's, it's like checking ourselves before we spit it out, you know. Just being and, kind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have to not say anything. Right, right. Because it's mandatory that you do when you feel it, because it's there. It's like, what is it, the third insight of, of uh, Celestine Prophecy. Right. right. They're just, you're compelled to say it you're, and you're shutting up, which is funny because you're actually practicing it only you don't realize it because you're keeping quiet. But then it comes to the point where I just got to say something. Yeah. But as a, you know, as somebody who's been teaching for so long too, I want to say something. If I, if I want any result from what I say, or if I'm just blowing smoke, you know, if right. I want any result, I want to say it in a way that the person's going to be receptive to it. And if I say it, you know, in an accusatory way or, or in your face way, they're going to shut down. Sure. You know, let's understand the audience. Any, and this, you know, kind of comes out of marketing, right? You really have to understand your audience in order to speak to them. Uh, and well, I think it's the fifth insight or fifth, um, habit in the uh, highly effective people right it is yes. you know speak kidding. first to understand then be understood and, right. and you can't speak to somebody in a language they don't understand that's exactly right even if it's english yeah. and everybody's english speakers i i talk exhaustively to uh, fellow activists in this way you know who want to you know protest and scream in people's face and you know i mean there's a time for protest right Right. But the way to do it, and, and you have to consider, what is my goal here? Is my goal to, to change minds, to open hearts? Is, is Well, if it is, then I need to really think through how, how I'm presenting this message. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. We, gotta, we have a challenge in the movement with that and, and how we're needing to pay attention to the, the tone and voice of the messages that we give because we don't want to get into uh, any kind of offensive language right right and there are certain things that certain trigger words that you just have to avoid and you can say it a lot of things in so many different ways and still have that compassion and kindness and invitation yeah in it it reminds me of my of a story about my southern nana right uh she study of human behavior is a very young person i used to watch her tell people off and they would hug her and thank her afterwards and i was like how the hell does she do that right <laughs> and you know she was one of those southern women who would say you just got to put a little sugar with it <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. my dad used to say uh, you know a good politician get can tell somebody to go to hell and get them to look forward to the journey that's right. Yeah, same thing. My grandfather would say that too. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is. It's so much about how you, you silver tongue devil you. Yes. But it's also about watching who you're talking to and reading how they're taking it in. So you have Absolutely. to Absolutely. To do that. micro expressions, body language, gesticulation. You've got to pay attention to those things, and oftentimes we don't. Right. How do you instill that in in the folks that you work with? Well, about. I, I do exercises with them about staying present, mm. you know, and I think that's something in the day and age that we're living in when we have so many distractions that we have mm -hmm. to, we, we, you've always had to practice it, but I think we have more distractions now than ever, right? And uh, so I think people's attention span has gotten much shorter in general, right? Well, and we see that in our children and, and it's not ADHD, it's just in the, the environment and how genetically they've adapted to it, in my opinion. And how fast stimulus is coming in at us constantly. So, you know, you might. Right. And we try to still put them in a box and train them, you know, in the way we were trained and it doesn't work. And we want, and then we try to drug them and do all kinds of stuff or put them in special classes and no, just pay attention to the child, ask them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the other side of that 
is one of the practices I've been doing and I've worked with the guys in, in you know, positive masculinity in this is when someone is talking to me and I feel my body, I feel tension in my body. So something triggered something that they said and I'm feeling, you know, you feel your, your, your jaw tighten and your shoulders tighten and so yeah. on, right? That's when curiosity comes in to save the day because I need to start being curious about unpacking why I'm reacting like that, where that's coming from. And that's how you can constantly grow and expand yourself and keep expanding if you are willing to do that. Instead now, of in those moments, I, I totally agree with you. That's one of the most empowering things that I've learned to do for me uh, too. And yet there's that time thing, yeah. right? When you're in the middle of a conversation and things are happening and, and you know, there's this like you saw in that OBE you were talking about, there's this other part of you that goes, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where breathing comes in. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and those realizations are when you hit the pause button, take the breath, they're instantaneous. You, you know where it is and, and, if you don't, then you're in, still in a bit of a denial and you're not quite vulnerable enough to listen to yourself that deeply yet. That's true. That's so true. And, you know, um, I'm sure you're very well, well aware of this is that as, as men, we're not taught growing up to listen to our intuition. We're oh, taught absolutely. Yeah. That's it's, it's, woman's thing, what's right? that? That's, yeah. that's either... <laughs> It's either not men, uh, or you're not a man, or you're crazy. Right, exactly. And, you know, our subconscious mind giving us those messages or, you know, wisdom from the outside coming in and giving us those messages, it has our best interest at heart. We need to learn to trust it. Absolutely. The... Is it the indigenous philosophy, and I'm not sure whether it came from the Aborigines or Native Americans. However, it's kind of ubiquitous. They uh, term it as a three brain system, the gut, the heart, and the head. Yes. The gut's where the vibrations get picked up, the sensitivity, and that's where everything connects with us. Solar plexus, seat of the will, intuition, gut feeling, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And then we've got this brain that goes, oh, how does that feel? Right. And then this brain, here's what I'm going to do about it. Yes. Right. That's so true. There's an interesting story that happened to me um, when I was about 28 or 29. I, a family friend, a close family friend, had, I, I got a call that he was in the hospital, mm -hmm. found out he had been attacked. And his wife told me he would like to speak to you. Would you go see him in the hospital? And I said, sure. I had, now I've taught self-defense all over the world, right? All over the world. And his family had taken a self-defense class from me. And when I teach self-defense, I tell people your best tool for self-protection is your own inner voice because your subconscious mind will pick up cues that will tell you there's danger before your conscious mind realizes. Yep. If you listen. Yep. And I say, when I teach this, men, you're much harder headed about listening to this. <laughs> so I'm going to call it out. I'm going to tell you, it's only there for your own good. Listen. Right. Because you'll argue with it. Men tend to argue with, oh, I'm, I can handle myself. It's fine. You know, <laughs> you'll sure. go on. Sure. The reason he called me in is because. He told me, you were right. He was a construction chief crew, big, strong, strapping guy. Every day on his way to his construction site, he'd stop at the local convenience store and fill up his big gulp mug, you know, for the day. Mm -hmm. And he pulled up to this convenience store and he said, I pulled my big truck up there and I just, he said, I turned the, the truck off and I had this weird feeling that something just wasn't right. And he said, I didn't listen to it. I was like, ah, I'm in a hurry. I got to get to the site. And I jumped out of the truck. Went There's in there. that time thing again. That's right. Went in there to fill up my mug. And he said, I took one step in the door. And that's the last thing I remember. 
there was a robbery going on and there was one guy guarding the door. And when he walked in, he got hit over the head with a baseball bat. And he was in the hospital with a really bad concussion and uh, brain bleed. And um, lucky to be alive. Lucky to be alive. But he told me, he's like, for God's sakes, he said, I will tell everybody what you taught us. From now on, I will be one of your, like, <laughs> sending the message out because you're right. I should have listened because I had that feeling. It was it's unfortunate that even though we hear that, we don't practice it enough because that second guess, you know, we it's the still small voice that some call, right? Yeah. And we want to dismiss it immediately. Right. It's not loud enough. It doesn't get our attention enough. That's right. And sometimes it's just the hair standing up on the back of our neck or just that feeling. Oh, yeah. Well, that ought to be pretty obvious, huh? <laughs> or just that feeling that something isn't right. And one yeah. of the things that the problems with human beings, you know, why they say, you know, when when the water goes out in the ocean and people are standing there in the beach and the water goes way out, the animals are already up the mountain. The people are standing there going, wonder what's going on <laughs> before the tsunami comes, right? Well, yeah. Animals don't question. They feel the energy change and they move. Well, they're part of that consciousness. It's a symbiosis where man hasn't human has not allowed themselves that acquiescence to the symbiosis on earth right you know yep. we've treated that like uh, the confusion i think started when we misinterpreted uh that you shall have dominion over the earth right right that wasn't meant as do whatever you want it was meant as stewardship definitely i totally agree <laughs> yes yeah. How come it took us so long to figure it out? Well, there's still a lot of people that haven't figured it out. I know. <laughs> Fortunately. Speaking of figuring it out, we're, we're beginning to kind of yeah. run short on time. Or, or gosh, this is so great. I, I just enjoy the conversation. Yeah. Um, let's focus on, on maybe a simple thing that in every you know person's life, what they meet daily, that there's some tasty tidbit that you could offer that would sh begin to shift their awareness or give them something that that they could begin to practice practice and rely on uh, maybe even a technique or something that when they have that sensation then they have something to go to in response yeah you know i think that technique i talked about just a few minutes ago when you feel starting to be consciously aware of tension in your own body. Because our bodies will tell us what's going on with us emotionally, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so when your body is telling you something is not right emotionally, what happens is your body gets, there's tension that happens in your body, right? Right. Your body is not at peace. And, and, it doesn't feel like everything's flowing together, right? It feels like there's resistance. And I think the first step is to become aware of that. When that happens, try to take that moment to pause. Like you said, push the pause button and check in with yourself. You know, we talk a lot about checking in with people in our lives, but we also have to check in with ourselves. Sure. Right? What's going on in there? Get curious about it. Why is this happening? And that's how we take care of our own mental health and physical health, mm -hmm. I think, is we keep checking in with ourselves because our body will tell us what it needs. <laughs> Absolutely. If we're willing to listen. I totally agree with you. have learned that. Yeah. yeah. Now, is it appropriate to have that conversation with yourself out loud? <laughs> I do when I'm alone. Or when it's just me and my wife in the house and my dog, my dog doesn't care. <laughs> right. Well, the reason I'm asking is because that therein begins the conversation between the two, yeah. right? If there's, when there is that tension take place, that's kind of an icebreaker, right? Because you're, you're not projecting. You're saying, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what's making my body feel this way as we're talking because it's doing something. I'm not quite sure I understand what it is. Can we unpack that? A little bit together yes yeah i i definitely is that possible and and 
how willing do you think people are to go there? Well, you know, it depends on, I think we all have to get to a place where we're, where we, our focus is about growing and living a healthier existence and our well-being is important to us versus, you know, running to make a dollar or. To right. fit well, wouldn't that be the core? Or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But wouldn't that be the core uh, that we cover everything else up with? Oh, God, yeah. Right. And so we start from there. So it, it's getting rid of the chatter, the chaff, the BS in the way. Um, and could it also be relying more on an experience system rather than a belief system? Mm. Where you're in the moment enough that you're so in tune and inquisitive about it that your belief systems are suspended and that's you're able to just place. peer yeah that's a magical place when you can get to that that you know <laughs> there's something pure about that place right yeah yeah and i mean what do you think the, holds us well we've had a whole conversation about what holds us back from that right? uh, and, and you gave a great um suggestion as to you know pay attention to yourself just just be aware and that's a, a great beginning it is. To start there and because once you're aware then you can make choices and you're responsible and you know the, you're given more knowledge from which to build yeah totally and yet you know it is i would say very challenging with all the distractions in our world right we have to be willing to make that a priority and consciously <laughs> make that a priority well, right. And, and yet, in in reality, it's challenge circumvention when you are in that place. Oh, yeah. Right? And then the challenges only give you, I, I see them as opportunistic right now, right? I didn't earlier, right? Yeah. Because you get all butt puckered and, and silly about what is happening. And then when you realize, oh, wait a minute, I can just, you know, if you don't have any immediate actual physical danger taking place right. right and that's pretty rare then there's this opportunity because it's emotional danger that you're feeling yeah and there's that opportunity just to pause and have a different opinion so yeah it's so it's so pure and important and for us to like also like pay attention the other thing i would say to our inner dialogue when i talked about that inner dialogue I think most people go along unconscious about it and they just let it, like you said, they just let it blah, 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 blah. And they don't. Right. Well, 70 thought, thoughts a day is what I've heard yeah. we have. And a lot of them are repetitive thoughts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can just become aware of those thoughts, which is kind of what the meditative practice is about. It's not necessarily shut up, although that's the ultimate, you know, because in that silence is the voice of being. However, you got to pay attention. You got to watch your thoughts and allow them to be, because if you resist them, they'll consist, they'll just persist and you'll never get rid of them. However, when you begin to watch them, then you can begin to go, oh, yeah, that makes, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, one of the things as a, you know, a, a retired professional athlete, I mean, of course we were given, you know, sports psychologists that taught us a lot of tricks to that. But when you get to the when you get to a world-class level or a high level in anything anybody's doing, mm -hmm. everybody at that level is good. Everybody's skill set is good, right? Everybody knows what they're doing, you could say, of course, or they wouldn't be there. Right. What makes the difference, though, is those that can control what we called in, in the athletics the mind game of it. Yeah. Is those that can take control of that because everybody's really great physically there and, they, you know... <laughs> So that's the difference is the people who can control or get a hold of mm -hmm. that inner chatter because uh, that'll, that'll beat you at, right. at your game. At when you're in the zone, not only can, uh, what is it, the gamma yeah. waves, I guess it is, when they uh, hook up the athletes, whether they're visualizing that's right. or actually doing, same areas in the same. brain light up. Same thing, yeah. So you can practice it before you do it. And I did, I've done that many, many times. Of I'm training, sure. You know, but also when you take like, 
for instance, if you're in a competition, you take a hard hit, which everybody's going to, you know, have something happen. I mean, even if you're in a non-contact sport, somebody scores on you somehow, you know, like if you're playing tennis or something and they ace you a few times, that kind of has a mental effect, right? Mm -hmm. But having a hold of that inner game, you know, is, is how you pull yourself out of that. And you don't let that, you know, tell yourself, I'm defeated already. I'm defeated already. That's how you can come back from that. Yeah. All gonna play golf, one shot the next. You That's don't right. carry. That's right. You know, it's just a single shot. That's and right. it, it's a great, I mean, talk about the Zen of golf. Oh, right? yeah. That's right. It puts you there. And, and you can tell where you're at by how you're playing. That's if, if you're, you know, and like you, in your sport, you can tell where you're at by how much you can release to the moment to be present. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So those cool. are the practices I would leave people with. For, yeah. Awesome. Mac, this has been just an amazing conversation. And I, I know it's just treasure trove of information, right? And, and things to relate to, to practice, to cognate and, and commiserate on, too. Um, not that I like alliteration or anything. <laughs> Mom was an English teacher. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. What can I say? Um, beautiful woman she was. And I just really appreciate your your time and uh, your willingness to come on. And maybe we can have uh, another one at some point. And, and there's some other things I might follow up you, with you on. And Great. You. I would love that. Yeah. yeah it's too. been a pleasure. Yeah, cool. Uh, again, thank you very much, and I will have information about you and your books and website and, and stuff down below the description. Great. Wonderful. It's been great to connect with you. Yeah. I would love to carry this on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we will have a different carry on. Right? For sure. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> All right. Zen. Will do. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. And you too. And namaste and in lock catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time.